Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me today to um, PyData Pi Hamburg. Um, yeah, I have um, followed PyData's activities in Hamburg for quite a while, but I've never really uh, took the opportunity to give a talk here myself. So I'm very happy that today is the day where I will do this. Um, just a very short introduction about me. I'm um, Paul. I'm uh, head of uh, AI and data science at uh, Data Drivers. We are a small IT consulting firm in Hamburg. And um, yeah, today I want to talk about MLOps, about the concept of MLOps, what it entails, what it means, and a little bit about the tools and um, some best practices that I, for me personally, have accumulated um uh, as as i've been working as a data scientist and consultant in this field <clears throat> so i will kick things off with uh yeah the question what is actually the notion of mlops and in a very straightforward sense you could say mlops uh is just the combination of machine learning and devops um so basically yeah the the, the um the, the, the concept or the field of uh, training algorithms based on data, uh, finding patterns uh, in data um, combined with uh, um, yeah, the field of um, best practices in software engineering, um, uh, of um, automation, of um, um, continuous integration, continuous deployment, all these concepts. Um, and that's, that's actually part of the story. <clears throat> And then um, you could think of it uh, in another way, um, basically in, in kind of a hierarchy of needs um, way, where uh, MLOps is, is uh, at the top of the, the, py the pyramid, and you would need uh, several layers uh, below it to make it actually work and to implement it. Uh, so you would need uh, the traditional DevOps layer, you would need to build data pipelines, uh, platform automation, and then on top of everything else, you can start building MLOps. <clears throat> and then there is another concept uh, which is very important to MLOps, and that's uh, that's um, that it is iterative and continuous. Um, and just as in traditional DevOps, uh, you have this idea of, of, a, of continuity, of um, iterating uh, upon your software and trying to make this process as uh, smooth as possible. Um, so it's it's kind of the way uh, the, the, a similar way uh, how you think about MLOps uh, uh, if you extend this kind of um, yeah, continuous process. Um, I took this uh, uh, visualization from uh, Larissa Vizengarieva, uh, who does a lot of um, yeah research and blogging in, in the field of MLOps, and I particularly like this one because of these uh, three components. Um, that, um, that are uh, entailed here. And I will briefly just go into each of them uh, a little bit more in, in detail so we can see what, what it is about. So first of all, uh, in every machine learning project, you have the design phase, which um, you can yeah, label as project design. Um, so a very big part of it is the problem definition. And um, usually, um, yeah, this is, can be quite a quite a tricky thing to do because uh, what you aim for is uh, to translate some kind of problem from a real world context uh, into something that is solvable with machine learning. And if you work uh, as a data scientist in industry, usually you, you want to solve some kind of business problem. And um, this business problem can be um, very, very hard to operationalize uh, and, and very difficult to put into terms so you, that you can actually solve it with uh, a machine learning algorithm. So that's basically, uh, that, that's definitely part of, of the process. And then what follows is that you will need to have to define some business KPI, uh, which is also very important. So uh, for instance, <clears throat> if you want to solve a business problem, engagement of people in your uh, streaming a service, uh, and you want to measure this engagement in, uh, in, in a, something like a click-through rate. So you want to um, try to make more people click 
on, on something that you recommend them and you want to en enhance how, how many times they click on, on something uh, in relationship to how, how often they see it. So that could be a business KPI. But um, if you train the algorithm, uh, for instance, some recommendation system algorithm like collaborative filtering, you wouldn't uh, necessarily optimize your uh, algorithm itself on this metric. So there is kind of a challenge to align the metrics that you will track while training your algorithm and the business KPIs that in the end you are trying to manipulate with your system. And then obviously you have to add things like data quality checks uh, and uh, something like a definition of success. Uh, so um, that could be something like uh, enhancing engagement. Okay, so let's jump to the second phase, which is labeled as model development. This uh, probably is the, 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 the phase that is uh, something or is most familiar to people who who have data science experience. So uh, here we assume we have some kind of data set that we can uh, train an algorithm on upon. Uh, so we would do things like exploratory data analysis. We would define some kind of ev evaluation scheme. How do we split our data? How do we ev evaluate the performance of our algorithms and stuff like that? Then we would implement the model and do training and validation. So basically, very standard machine learning steps. And then in the third phase, you would add something like operations. So this is something very DevOps oriented. And um, yeah, you could, you could um, for instance, uh, if, you, if you serve your model uh, through some kind of API, uh, you would necessarily also um, apply the same uh, methods that you would apply to any other API. So you would uh, monitor the performance of the API, something like um, uh, requests per seconds, failures, uh, latency times, and stuff like that. <clears throat> but uh, obviously, on top, then you would monitor things that are specific to machine learning algorithms. Um, for instance, uh, data drift. So basically, um, uh, how your uh, training or prediction data is changing over time, or also uh, degradation of your model performance over time. Because once you deploy a model into the wild or into production, um, you can assume that many times your data will be changing and you will need to retrain your model at certain times. And then lastly, uh, in this area, there's also the field of automation. So um, you will yeah, probably um, consider traditional DevOps practices like continuous integration and deployment, especially if you serve your models uh, uh, through an API. And then obviously also things like continuous retraining of your models. Um, yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, automating the ML lifecycle is much harder than automating the, the life cycle of um, yeah, traditional uh, APIs or microservices uh, because many um, decisions are rather soft than very hard. So for instance, uh, if you monitor your model performance over time, uh, you have to define th a cer certain thresholds yourself and it's not really obvious when the system fails or not. So, so sometimes there are uh, humans in the loop needed to, to make uh, certain decisions when model has to be retrained. But uh, yeah, so these are the three main phases of um, MLOps. And um, yeah, you can kind of conclude that um, part of it is solution design. So basically you think about how you solve some real world problem with MLOps. Um, then obviously you need model development and training, the very basic machine learning or data science um, um, tools and um, yeah, um, things you do as, as a data scientist. Um, and then uh, you also want to automate these pipelines. You want to serve your model so that um, people actually can use it for something they, they need it for. 
And um, then what you could also add is um, that you want to be able to reproduce your results. Um, and you also want to be able to experiment. Uh, and that um, yeah, relates to the idea that you um, uh, that in, in, in this MLOps li life cycle, <clears throat> you think of um, your machine learning system as something that is continuously improving. And um, you would want to uh, try out different model architectures, for instance, or different um, um, feature engineering uh, techniques. And then you want to be able to um, reliably uh, um, and confidently um, decide which model is actually um, performing better. Uh, and for that, you would need to have some kind of experimentation tracking uh, implemented. So in a very rough sense, this is kind of the field or the, the, the things that the whole uh, uh, yeah, concept of MLOps en entails. Um, and there is one other um, way of, of uh, explaining the concept um, that was coined by Noah Gift. Um, and he, uh, yeah, he, he designed this uh, four field uh, matrix where um, basically um, MLOps is described as uh, consisting of, of these four dimensions. And I think that's, that's uh, pretty, um, pretty good way of describing the concept as well. Um, so you not only need the DevOps part, but you also need some kind of um, business skills, especially when it comes to this question of how do I translate uh, the business question into something that is solvable with machine learning. And then obviously you also need the more fundamental things like data processing and uh, um, models and algorithms. So um, that is actually describing pretty well what makes uh, MLOps very difficult because it's kind of a very multidisciplinary skill set that uh, is uh, incorporated into this field. Okay, so that was about the notion of MLOps. Uh, now I was trying to give you an idea of what components an ML system might entail. And obviously you can kind of um, um, enrich this and make this more sophisticated and more complex. But uh, our, the thing I was thinking of was what are the components that every system, like a minimal system should entail? And so I came up with these uh, six uh, things that you would need if you want to run machine learning models in production or a fully fledged ML system. And that's data storage um, for like your training and validation data, uh, a training environment. So you need some kind of runtime where you can actually train your algorithm. You would want to have a model registry where you store your models and where you can also, also version your models. So like for instance, if you retrain every week, uh, you want to make sure that you have like, that you keep track of which is the newest model and things like that. Um, <clears throat> then you want to have some kind of experimentation platform that you can actually iterate on the performance and get better and better. You want uh, some kind of serving environment um, where you can actually serve your predictions to your users and uh, you would need some kind of monitoring. So again, this is very opinionated. That's what I think is, um, is um, necessary for an L ML system, but it's, it's definitely not everything that you could think of uh, like um, as components that you could add to the system. But it's like a minimal uh, system I could think of. Um, so if you look in uh, how these components would play together, so at, at the beginning, you would have a data storage where your training and validation data lives. You would then pull that into your training environment, train, train an algorithm, um, which would then be put into your model registry. The training environment is linked to your experimentation platform where you can keep track on um, uh, about how your training runs were performing, like what kind of setup you were using, what algorithm, what hyperparameters you were using. And then you would um, take the model from the registry, serve it, uh, add some monitoring on it, and then 
yeah, the only thing that you would probably add as well is some kind of orchestration of all these components in the system. Yeah, so if you feel like Uncle Roger here, <laughs> uh, MLOps is really hard. And um, yeah, I want to go into some aspects that make it really hard. Um, so um, to start with, um, it's, uh, it's the ML tooling landscape. This is a very nice way um, of visualizing uh, um, ML tooling. It's uh, from, I think from 2020 from uh, Chip Huyen. Um, and uh, what you can see here is basically like the, the, the areas or the components, the fields in ML, in the ML tooling space, things like data pipelines, serving model training. Uh, and then you have some sub components and then I'm gonna just jump into one of these components, which was a, a data pipeline. And then on the, on the outer uh, ring, you basically see uh, uh, companies and open source uh, tooling products uh, for just for the field of data or for this area of data pipelining. And uh, you get the idea. It's like a, a, a huge amount of tooling that exists in this field. I think uh, she counted something like uh, more than 200 tooling uh, tools and, and services that you can use in the field of uh, ML systems or ML ops. And um, so, yeah, it's it's getting really hard to choose what to use and what not and what suits your um, use case best. Um, so, yeah, that can be very um, uh, confusing to choose the right tooling. Then obviously something that is very related to MLOps is the issue of uh, technical debt. So there's this um, yeah, very famous, uh, almost notorious uh, paper that came out by Google in 2015 about the hidden technical debt in machine learning systems, where they were actually um, pointing out that um, yeah, what many people have been focusing on, which was mainly the model development, uh, you know, like um, a lot of the, the ML hype was um, at that time influenced by progress made in deep learning and neural networks and everything. So people were focusing a lot on model architecture, on implementing state-of-the-art models, and uh, were kind of a little bit forgetting about things that are necessary for the systems to be built around it. And they visualized visualize this with this... Um, with these boxes so if you look carefully the, the black box in the middle the very tiny one that's uh, the ml code and then uh, you see all these other components necessary around it and uh, what they were trying to highlight is that if you want to build production ready machine learning systems uh, the code of the model is actually just a very small bit um, but I think there is another fallacy that you can run into if you try to build something good in the field of ML ops, uh, and that's uh, what I call over engineering. Um, so it's basically the idea of building uh, your fully fledged uh, ML ops platform or your ML system for, let's say, uh, two or three years, uh, adding all the components, making it like super shiny and nice. But in the end, uh, you're um, failing to solve a, a real world problem. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's that's another part of, of the story. Uh, you could also um, kind of highlight it with this uh, tweet, which kind of describes it also in a nice way. Uh, um, you, you aim for something big, you are architecting, architecting an NLP model, you're launching beefy GPU instances. Um, then you're trying to debug your, your um, huge neural network. Uh, and find, try to find out in which layer the problem is in. And in the end, you deploy a five line regex instead. So um, yeah, so what this actually tells uh, to me or, or well, what I think is very important to keep in mind is uh, that um, complex models do not always solve your, your cases uh, more efficiently and you should always be very careful about deciding where and when to use machine learning as well. So just uh, to summarize this part, um, I think like the, the main hurdles of MLOps and what makes it so difficult 
is that there are no standards yet. So if you look at the field of data analytics and uh, modern BI, um, there's something called the modern data stack where you have toolings like dbt, for instance, uh, that are kind of um, uh, yeah, uh, agreed upon that this is like the way to, to do um, data analytics uh, today. And, and um, you have some, some tooling that, that has been um, yeah, shown to be reliable and um, that people uh, use very frequently. Um, and there is not something like this uh, in, in the field of MLOps yet. There may be in a few months or years, but uh, yet there is not really something that like a go-to solution that you can just uh, copy and implement. Um, and what is very related to this is that there is this, just this confusing tooling landscape with um, yeah, essentially a new tool uh, framework coming out almost every week, um, which makes it very uh, difficult to decide which is the right tool that fits my needs. I would also say that there is a high entry barrier for small teams. So if you don't really have this uh, skill set and all these, these, these different skills in your team that are required, it can be very difficult to, to get started. But let's get started anyway. Uh, as I promised, <laughs> I want to show some best practices and um, I want to show or give you an idea of how I would start and how we, for instance, at Data Drivers also help people getting started with MLOps. And um, yeah, just some best practices um, that I would recommend to everyone is um, first of all, to start where you are. So basically um, to look at what are what does my team look like? What kind of skills do I have? Um, what kind of infrastructure do we use? Um, where should we run our uh, ML system on and things like that. And then try to start from where you are and continuously develop your system from there. And what is also very important, I think, is the idea that you want to iterate. You don't want to build the, full, the fully fledged system in one go. You want to try things out and then maybe add a component and add another one and so on. So you basically um, build the system while your whole journey with machine learning basically um, uh, yeah, is getting on its way. Um, you want to balance the four fields. I think that's also very important. Uh, so not only think about uh, how to build the perfect uh, system, but also think about how to solve the business problem and try to keep these both of these things in balance will actually yield you pretty good results, I, I think. And then uh, as a last one, beware of the tooling trap. Don't go for something fancy and shiny and new. Maybe sometimes choose the more boring and standard, but robust and reliable solution instead. And I also brought you like two small examples how I would uh, implement like a very minimal ML system. And the first example I described uh, as from BI to AI, so basically from uh, business intelligence or data analytics to AI. And you could think of some uh, company that um, perhaps has a data warehouse already living uh, on some kind of cloud platform that could be AWS, GCP, Azure, whatever. And uh, they want to um, start their journey with machine learning and want to build a machine learning system. So what you can do then is, for instance, use Airflow, which is like the boring and traditional solution for uh, automation and orchestration, but yet the reliable solution. Uh, you could use the cloud storage for your data storage. You could then uh, perhaps choose uh, a cloud managed uh, service that provides training and serving environments. I think all of the major cloud providers um, um, offer this kind of service where you basically uh, can um, just um, yeah, send your training and serving scripts uh, to, to the services and they handle everything uh, that runs in the background. So the whole infrastructure is handled by the cloud provider and this is a very easy start if you don't have uh, 
all the skills necessary for running the heavy load DevOps um, stuff in the background. And what I would add then as like the only a little bit more complicated thing would be uh, MLflow, uh, which is an open source um, um, software uh, that uh, basically allows you to manage the whole model lifecycle. Um, so it uh, allows you to track your um, training runs and your experiments. Um, and uh, it also provides a model registry. So if you add that, you basically have a uh, um, uh, functioning ML system, very minimal, but functioning ML system. And I would say if you come from this background, it's kind of not that hard to, to build it this way. And then I also have like another example to also illustrate that you would probably approach the, the um, topic differently if you have a different background and if you just do something different. So imagine here you are uh, like um, some kind of SaaS company or some kind of um, uh, company that uh, runs software as a business uh, or some kind of web shop. Um, and you probably, or the, the, the chances are very high that you already um, have a Kubernetes cluster deployed where your uh, services are running upon. Um, then you also probably have the skill set and the people uh, that are able to manage the cluster. <clears throat> and then you could, for instance, aim for something different. Um, for instance, like Kubeflow, uh, which is, uh, again, an open source uh, um, framework that actually allows you to manage many components of uh, the ML system. So it provides you um, <clears throat> a nice UI that allows you to um, to to manage the, the pipelines and and the um, and the the docs or decks like the, the whole um, the, the, yeah the training and the serving pipelines uh, it allows you to track uh, your experiments uh, and it also provides solutions for serving your models uh, in the end so um, yeah so I guess that kind of highlights um, that if you that that um, I would recommend to to look at um, look at the, the the point of where you are uh, if you want to make your moves into um, uh, building your first ML systems. So yeah, uh, just to give a quick summary, um, I would always recommend to start where you are to iterate and to keep uh, things uh, simple and stupid. <clears throat> I would look definitely into the field of open source, and I think it's a very, uh, very, um, again, yeah, a very, uh, very uh, good um, solution to use open source tooling because it's uh, it's uh, free to use. It usually has a, a lot of things implemented that uh, other software solutions cannot provide, and um, but you should always keep in mind that uh, the tooling field is kind of uh, confusing. Um, and then you should uh, focus on the usefulness of your model and your system. Uh, and uh, yeah, you shouldn't try to build the perfect solution from scratch. If it's not useful, then you shouldn't build it. Uh, yeah, so these are kind of the things that I would give you at hand. And I think uh, if, if you take them like as a starting point, um, then uh, yeah, you can you can you can start your journey in, into the field of ML systems, um, uh, but yeah, as I said earlier, it's it's a journey, and you should enjoy the ride, and you should continuously improve on your um, system, and uh, yeah, enjoy it. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the story I wanted to tell you today. Uh, just like uh, as a as a last little uh, slide, I. Um, wanted to mention that if you want to meet me or uh, one of my colleague, we will be at the Data Lift Summit uh, in June in Berlin, which is organized by the AI Guild. Um, there are lots of people from the data science community giving talks about use cases and there are workshops and everything. So in case you are there, please feel free to reach out. And uh, there we will also have the chance to um, 
hear uh, one of my um, colleagues, Kai, who will uh, talk a little bit more in depth about how we build uh, a transformer model uh, ML system uh, on the Google Cloud platform for predicting demand um, at, yeah, at scale in production. Yeah, so thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, Soren, I think Soren was the first one who raised his hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Hi, Soren. <laughs> Please excuse my very bad sound and <laughs> probably no video or hopefully no video because I'm uh, looking kind of rough right now, but anyways, uh, you've been uh, you've been telling us about um, much about this uh, life cycle, ML ops life cycle, and uh, and you've shown at the end in many or well, in the last sketches for uh, in the last examples uh, the monitoring um, bubble, but never mentioned it. And in <laughs> in my experience, it is really uh, really hard to find a solution that incorporates. Um, pipeline monitoring, infrastructure monitoring, and maybe even um, kind of monitoring what my my MA system is, is doing right now and how, I don't know, um, automatic retraining works, how the model performance is, is it de degrading or not. Can you can you maybe name some examples or what, what your view on this topic is? Um, yeah. So yeah, thank you, Zuren, for the question. You, uh, it's a, already a pretty uh, tough question, I guess, um, because uh, as you mentioned correctly, um, model monitoring is something very hard and very difficult. Um, yeah, I think first of all, you would need to um, differentiate between the things that you would want to monitor. Um, as I mentioned, um, you can monitor more traditional um, things that you would, uh, yeah, monitor if, if for that are um, important for every kind of API. So you would monitor things like um, requests per second, failures, latency, and these kind of things. But that obviously all, on, only applies if you have an online uh, prediction or online serving uh, kind of framework where you basically also uh, receive requests against uh, your endpoint and your model. Uh, if you do like a batch serving where you only um, serve your model in your uh, data pipeline and you basically calculate your predictions uh, in, in a batch, um, then this would be uh, diff different. Um, and then you can also look at um, um, monitoring your actual model performance, which is like, I would say the most important thing to do. Um, <clears throat> so you want to monitor, uh, um, for instance, let's say your accuracy of your classifier. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, it's kind of difficult to implement because what you need is not only you uh, to collect uh, um, um, data, uh, 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 or, uh, you would need to collect all the, the, the data that is, uh, um, or the fresh data uh, that comes in, for instance, uh, if, when you serve your model uh, in an online um, API endpoint, uh, and, uh, and then kind of um, store your prediction results uh, and evaluate them. So that's a little bit more effort than um, yeah, just training the model. Uh, but I would say that uh, tracking the the, um, the the model performance itself is already like a really bad, big step towards um, monitoring. Uh, then you could add some more complexity, something like data drift. So you would basically um, compare um, the the data that um, is uh, is collected uh, on your endpoint. Uh, with the with your training data, and then you would uh, kind of try to estimate uh, how much uh, these um, the data is uh, different. So you would perhaps look at distributions of your data, uh, also like kind of multivariate distributions and stuff like that. Um, but 
uh, I would always start with like the more simple things uh, that uh, are more important in, in the in the yeah information chain, um, so to speak. And uh, for instance, start with like monitoring the model performance. Um, uh, Kai is, will be also will be talking about this uh, in detail. Um, what we did um, right now, or what we do right now, is just use uh, services like uh, CloudWatch, or um, I have uh, I've forgotten how 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 the service is called in the GCP. Um, but there is a similar service that is um, yeah that you can use for this kind of purposes, and then we just uh, monitor um, the model uh, performance over time, and that's already difficult enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. Cool. Uh, so, Ugo Chiku, I'm, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. No, 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 Kai. That's, that's perfect. Well, well, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes very well. Oh, great. great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have a lot of challenges because. My team and I, we really are very, very short on time. So we do not have the luxury to experiment a lot on different platforms. But um, we are looking at uh, this same pipeline stuff we just showed right now. And for code, for, for managing the code side of things, uh, my team is suggesting we just do it. And then to manage data, then we just don't. Um, pardon me, uh, Paul. Can you hear uh, Hugo uh, well? It's okay. I can. I can hear. Maybe you can speak a little bit louder. Then would be okay. perfect. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Great. So, um, can you hear me now? Yes. It's better. Okay. Yeah, it's so, better. Yeah. So, is it better now? Yeah, it's way better. Okay. Cool. So. Um, like I was saying earlier, um, I and my team are short on time. So we really do not have time to experiment a lot on the different frameworks that we have. So I just wanted to check with you if this looks like a plan. Okay, so for, for code, to manage the code um, side of things, we want to use Git, right? And then for to manage data, we want to use DVC. That's this open source data version control. Um, for experimentation, we want to use MLflow. And then for orchestration, we are stuck between Jenkins and Airflow, but because really we're, we're on a low budget. Uh, so we are trying to not go the way of um, stuff like Prefect and GitHub Action. All right. Um, so um, do you think that it looks like a plan or we should just rework our ideas? What do you think? Yeah, uh, I think it's, it, it sounds um, sounds like a good plan. I uh, I would I would uh, definitely um, do do things very similar. And I think none of these tools uh, I I wouldn't oppose any of these tools. So I would definitely use Git or GitLab for code versioning uh, for managing code. Uh, using if you want to use the data versioning too. I think DVC is also a good choice and MLflow is something that we would use ourselves. Um, yeah, and then in terms of orchestration, my recommendation would be to use the tool that you um, feel more comfortable with. Um, yeah, I presented Airflow as something that is very uh, intuitive and easy to use because um, that's what I experienced from um, our team and our clients that um, yeah, Airflow is very versatile and very, uh, you have a lot of components and you can build complex DAGs and everything. And many people know it, but if you feel like that Jenkins is, uh, is more suitable and that your team knows it well, then yeah, you might also go for that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And good luck with the project. All right, thank you. Nice. Is there any more questions? No. Great. Um, 
Yeah, we really like to check out this this data lib submit. Um, great, uh, Alex and Daphne. Yes, we're here. Yes. <laughs> I really like our meetup today. I think Paul really gave us a lot of nice inputs. Yes, he did. And I, I didn't know about a cube flow or cube flow. I'm not sure how to pronounce that one right now, but this is the one to check out. Thanks for that. I knew ML flow and I like it, um, but not familiar with the other one. So um, yeah, if if that's everything, um, thank you everybody for being here tonight, spending some time learning about um, so many new things <laughs> with our speakers. Um, thank you so much for your time, and um, we will be hosting our next meetup in two months, right? The next one will be in July. Yes, that's yep. the time right now. Cool. And um, if any of you like to hang out from time to time with us, uh, don't forget to write um, PyData Hamburg to join as a volunteer. We're fun people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we would definitely benefit from having more local hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's so funny. All right. Uh, by the way, I will stop recording now. <laughs>